Yes, I, I think one of the big challenges really in, in the study of climate change is, is in trying to find robust methods of uh, calculating CO2 emissions from different transport modes, um, different logistical activities. Um, a lot of work has been done in this area so far, so we're gradually ascending the, the learning curve on this. Regrettably, I think many companies are still using average values which are unrealistic, um, where they have little knowledge of some of the assumptions that have been made in calculating those figures, um, such things as the average loading of the, of the vehicles in question. And uh, unfortunately, that can give us a, a distorted view of the relative carbon impact of different transport modes. Yes, that would be the holy grail, if ever we could have such a thing. Um, I, I think my hope is that eventually we will see greater energy and, and uh, CO2 transparency across the supply chain. Um, one of the problems at the moment, I think, is that many companies that outsource their transport don't have access to the energy data. You, you know, that, that information is, is held by the carriers. And so many of the users of these transport services have to find some other means of trying to estimate their carbon footprint, you know, doing conversions from tonne kilometres into CO2. And for that purpose, they use just average carbon intensity values. And uh, one thing we've done recently is, is review the published carbon intensity values, and, and you find that they vary quite enormously for transport modes and for countries. Um, but eventually, the hope is that um, all users of transport will get access to the energy data and they'll be able to work out specific carbon values for their particular operations. But it may take us 10 or 15 years maybe to get to that position. Uncertainty is a, is a constant problem. I, I, I think uh, one thing we can do is uh, encourage maximum transparency in this so that the people who are providing us with carbon data should be fairly open about the sources of the primary data, about the assumptions they've been making, about the methodology that they've employed, so that the person interpreting that data can have some understanding of how the numbers have been derived. Uh, regrettably, a lot of the transport-related carbon data in the public domain at the present time um, it seems to have been derived from black boxes and, and, and so we, we don't have an insight into the origins of those numbers and I, I, I always counsel that those numbers should be used very cautiously. Um, the hope is that, that through time as our knowledge accumulates in this area, um, as more data becomes available, as, as we develop more sophisticated systems for analysing it, we'll be able to reduce the confidence limits and, and build up the level of certainty in the numbers. But it'll be a slow and painful process, uh, I'm sure. And, and, and it's not even just a case of reducing the uncertainty, it's also a case of trying to improve the consistency of the numbers and uh, apply more general standards here in, in the way that we collect the numbers and also in the way in which we analyse and, and interpret the, the data as well. I, I must confess to being very sceptical about the practicality and, and, and the benefits of putting carbon labels on individual products. Um, you know, some people subscribe to the view that once you tell consumers how much CO2 has been emitted by the production and distribution of a product, that consumer behaviour will then change and uh, we will then move towards uh, a sort of new generation of low carbon products. Uh, but first of all, I, I don't think it's going to be that easy to induce a, a change in consumer behaviour. But I think it's, it's going to be also very difficult um, to carbon audit supply chains at a, at, a, at a product level, which you'd have to do to be able to put a carbon label in products. Um, the research that we've done um, suggests that this is a very time-consuming, very laborious, very expensive process. And at the end of the day, there's still a large amount of uncertainty. Um, the other possibility is that uh, if, if carbon labelling of products did influence companies' market shares, then companies would be tempted to de under-declare their CO2 emissions. So there would therefore have to be a parallel system of auditing to make sure that the figures companies were reporting were actually accurate. So we, just as we have financial auditing, we would need a, a parallel system of carbon auditing to ensure that the carbon data consumers were given was actually accurate and, 
and realistic. And uh, I, again, that would further add to the cost. Um, some of the work that's been done suggests it may cost £20,000 per stock keeping unit, per item, to put a carbon label on products. And if you multiply that by all the products on the market, it would be a vast expenditure, probably many billions of dollars doing this exercise. I think that money could be much better spent actually implementing decarbonisation initiatives rather than just trying to put carbon labels on everything that we buy and sell. So many of the best practice measures that will cut uh, carbon and energy as well as cost um, by making transport cheaper may encourage companies to use more transport or it may cause them to reconfigure their logistic systems so that they cut their warehousing costs and reduce their inventory but perhaps at the expense of more transport. And um, I, I think there are various responses to that question. But what one is to say that the expectation is that the cost of energy is going to rise through time. But in the longer term, oil prices will almost certainly rise. Um, so that will offset some of the energy savings that we make from applying more grid fuel efficiency. Um, it may also be the case that, that governments will also increase the level of environmental taxation as well, so, so that government taxation may capture then some of the cost savings that are made by applying these efficiency measures. And, and that would then tend to suppress some of these second order effects. So presumably any carbon tax would be in addition to the current level of taxation on fuel, which is already at a very high level. And uh, you know, that is not going to go down very well with the haulage industry and uh, you know, with users of freight transport services. So, um, you know, politicians have a difficult task, I think, in trying to, to raise a level of taxation on what is already a fairly heavily taxed uh, sector of the economy. I think the first thing I would say to companies would be that most of the measures they would implement to cut carbon would also save money. Um, in many cases, this simply involves applying good business practice. You know, which will cut energy consumption and, and CO2. Uh, indeed, many of the decarbonisation measures um, would be self-financing and would offer quite a rapid payback uh, as well. As for what those measures would be, um, I think the research that's been done has suggested that uh, some measures are, are really quite cost-effective in cutting carbon. Um, driver training is one, and in, certainly in the case of road freight, um, training drivers in eco driving techniques, and then putting in place an incentive structure to make sure that they continue to apply those good driving Um So I think they're, they're, they're two of the uh, main measures I think that companies should uh, apply. But at, at present, one thing that we lack is a comprehensive data set on the relative cost effectiveness of applying a whole range of decarbonisation measures in logistics. Uh, we've got anecdotal evidence from a few companies that have applied measures, but what would be nice would be if we had industry-wide data, um, which would then be available to other companies so that they could see what would be the likely carbon benefits of applying a whole range of different techniques, and uh, I think we're some way from achieving that as yet.